The UK spends relatively more on housing than other nations. Not only that, but we have the highest share of property built before the war and face one of the highest costs of housing per square metre. On the metric of households who pay them more than 40% of their income on housing, the UK is the second worst in the world, second only to New Zealand. Now, the UK is not the only country to be facing a housing crisis. Housing is expensive around the world, especially in the Anglosphere. And it's no surprise to see that the most expensive places for housing, places like the UK and New Zealand, also have relatively low levels of housing supply. Now, the interesting question is whether the recent rise in interest rates will improve affordability in the coming years, or whether the impact on house building will create even more problems for the future. Home ownership is widely seen as an aspiration of British households. And if we look at the relative cost between private renting and owning with a mortgage, there's a big difference between the two models. This is why people strive and strain to take out a mortgage. But if we look at international comparisons, the UK home ownership rates are actually quite low. Home ownership rates peaked around 2007 and have been in decline ever since. And if we measure home ownership rates by the percentage of adults rather than households, the rate is even lower because many young people have been forced to live with their parents or in bigger shared housing. And the UK has seen the biggest slump in home ownership rates amongst the young compared to many other countries. The simple problem is that housing as a share of income has increased dramatically since the mid-1990s. It's currently running at a ratio of eight times income, and in many major cities such as London and Oxford and Cambridge, it's over ten times income. And there's been only a very modest improvement in affordability since the 2022 peak. Now, since the credit crunch of 2008, there has been new mortgage regulation to try to prevent the abuse of high mortgage multiples and there's better stress testing. What this means is the housing market is somewhat more resilient to higher interest rates, but also that young people find it much more difficult to buy, even if they would like to get away from a private rented sector. With median salaries running at only £35,000 and barely increasing in the past decade, a standard mortgage multiple of four times income leaves a young worker struggling to get anywhere near current average house prices. It's not just about housing costs, but in recent years we've seen a squeeze on disposable incomes, especially for would-be home buyers. We've seen taxes rise as a share of GDP, plus the burden of student loans for young graduates. And then on top of that, we've had the record rent increases. And the rise in rent is not always fully captured by CPI because they use an imputed value. But the main problem the UK has is we've had very low growth in real wages, whilst house prices and rents continue to rise. The result is that unless you have a very high income, parental wealth to help with deposit has become almost a key requirement for getting on the property ladder. The UK has become more unequal with a bank of mum and dad uh, supporting 47% of home purchases in 2023. Now, for those who did manage to buy, especially recently, uh, the recent rise in interest rates have caused a shock, with mortgage payments rising as a share of income to high levels. In sectors like buy to rent, we've seen arrears rise 50% as many struggle with a higher mortgage payment. Now, the effect of high interest rates has been to slightly improve mortgage affordability, with a 14% fall in real prices since 2022. But the average buyer is yet to notice any real sense that buying a house is uh, affordable, like it was in the most of the post-war period. Now, last month, mortgage approvals did rise, admittedly from low levels, but it is a sign that activity is returning to the housing market after a period of very low uh, property transactions. Now, there's also been an increase in homes for sale, and this perhaps explains the, to some, unexpected fall in prices last month, reported by Halifax and Nationwide. But this all raises the uh, question of whether the past six months is just a temporary bounce in prices, or a sign that a much 
needed correction is probably as much as you can expect and there's no prospect of further falls. Because if demand can be increasing in this climate of high interest rates, recession and low income growth, there's really no hope that UK housing will ever become affordable. However, before we herald a new chapter of house price growth, it is worth bearing in mind there is good empirical evidence that house prices historically react to higher interest rates with a time lag. Now, one OECD study found that a 1% rise in interest rates causes an 8% fall in real, that's inflation adjusted house prices. So with the UK having nearly 5% rise in interest rates, that's in theory a 40% fall in real prices. And even if interest rates were to be cut back to 4%, which is likely by the end of the year with inflation falling, it would still indicate that some house price falls are to come. Now, for those who are sceptical about the prospect of any further house price falls, don't forget this study was based on real life examples. For example, in Germany, house prices have fallen 20% since their 2022 peak, that's around 35% fall in real terms. Now, is the UK housing market so different that it is immune from uh, any kind of big house price falls? Well, house prices did fall in 2008 and the early 1990s. But I think that those hoping for a return to affordability levels last seen in the mid 90s were going to be disappointed because only modest falls in house price to income ratios are forecast. It's not just about income and interest rates, but the impact of wealth propping up uh, housing demand. So the result really is a two speed housing market between those who can add wealth to buying a house and those who can't. Now, one damaging impact of the higher interest rates has been a cut to home building. The end of last year saw so many projects either cancelled or not finished. Combined with high inflation, higher wages, the higher interest rates have really made it difficult for home builders who've pulled back from many projects. The result is that suppliers expected to fall further away from government targets. And the impact is particularly acute in the affordable housing sector. Housing associations are warning that they can't manage to build projects and have left many projects half finished. The National Housing Federation warned that funding for affordable housing is now inextricably linked to interest rates because of a change in the funding model since the austerity of the 2010s. But this means with higher interest rates, they can't build the 145,000 affordable homes that the UK really needs. Now, Labour do have a, an ambitious plan to build many new homes if they're elected next year. But the past 20 years do suggest that it's much easier to promise building housing than to actually deliver. And when the house building sector goes into recession and people stop working, it can be very difficult to get the uh, building sector going again. It needs a degree of momentum. You can't just pick a number and say that's what we should build. Now, in the post-war period, the UK was building much higher quantities of housing, in particular social housing. In fact, despite selling off one and a half million houses in the UK, the UK still has one of the highest rate of social housing in the OECD. But the problem is that the UK has very much underdevelopment of the private rented sector. The loss of social housing and the rise in the population, partly due to high levels of immigration, have not been met. The FT report, according to some estimates, the UK actually needs to build closer to 421,000 homes a year to catch up with a backlog. But currently, the country is struggling to meet even much more modest targets. And it's really hard to see a return to 400,000 homes a year, which we only briefly saw in the late 1960s. And that included many uh, council tower blocks, which later got demolished. Now, again, in international comparison, France is a similar sized country and they have been building on average 370,000 homes between 2010 and 2017. And in that period, the UK built almost half that, 154,000. So you can see the difference in home building between two countries. Perhaps it's easier to build in France with more land, but whatever the case, uh, France built a lot more. 
And building does make a difference to house prices. London has seen relatively low rates of house building and the highest rise in prices. Texas, which admittedly has much more space, has avoided excess price rises by being able to build more. Now, it is a fair point to say that sometimes supply is blamed too much for high prices. Certainly the boom in house prices since 2009 was to a large extent due to the ultra low interest rates. And some claim that the UK is actually a, a large number of empty homes and that the number of households is not as increasing as fast as the uh, increase in new dwellings. However, again, it's helpful to look at international comparisons. The UK has one of the lowest rates of housing vacancies, that's a spare houses not been used. Also, the number of houses per 1,000 inhabitants is very low in the UK. It is similar to Canada, New Zealand and the United States, all countries with high house price to income ratios. Also, don't forget that the number of new households is influenced by the high prices themselves, with many people, say, living with their parents or living in bigger households than they would prefer. But overall, it is private renters who are facing the biggest brunt of the UK housing crisis. In the past few years, rents have increased substantially, and on average, private renters pay a higher share of income than people who own a house, because private renters often have a combination of low income plus high housing costs. No wonder there's such a strong desire to buy a house, but the problem is for many people, it's still an unaffordable dream. The UK has a broken rented sector. Now, one thing I didn't go into too much detail was the role of quantitative easing on uh, the housing market and whether quantitative tightening may help to reduce prices in the coming years. This video goes into more detail if you're interested in that topic. Thanks.